Some of you have heard me speak about this man before. I'll mention him again because it helps illustrate, though, what we're going to look at this morning. I don't know how many of you have heard of a man named Pete Maravick. Uh, he's better known as Pistol Pete. He's one of the greatest, arguably the greatest college basketball players to ever live. He averaged over 44 points a game in his college career without a three-point line. He was an outstanding NBA player. He averaged over 24 points a game in the NBA, and he's well known for his ball handling and passing ability. He's a very gifted person, worked very hard at that. Later in life, and this is the most important part, he became a Christian. He died when he was 40 years old. But he became a passionate follower of Christ before he died. Uh, if I remember correctly, he sent a Bible to Larry King, and obviously Larry King live on CNN at that time. And as Larry King opened the Bible up, it had a personal inscription in there to him. And then he heard shortly after that that Pistol Pete had died that same day. One source said that Pistol Pete said, I don't want to be known as a basketball player. I want to be known as a Christian now. All the fame all the awards he had won, he said, I want to be known as a Christian now, is what Pistol Pete wanted to be known as. Now, I know today, uh, the young players, young basketball players, they look to today's athletes as their guides and their aspirations to look to the leaders and how to play. But I know many people, if they knew about Pistol Pete, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, they would want to be as skillful and as good as this man was at basketball. He was, it was unbelievable to see what he could do and what he was able to do. I remember, from the best I remember, a young boy was watching Pistol Pete play basketball one day, and he was just amazed at what he was doing. And he went and he asked Pistol Pete's father, how did he learn? How long did it take him to learn these things? And Pistol Pete's father said to the young boy, it took all his life. And the young boy said to Pistol Pete's father, oh, I don't have that long. You know, I think, I think all of us have, have realized in life, whether we've had dreams and aspirations, whether we've, we've, we still have them possibly, that is a lot easier to dream about something than to do something. Is that right? It's a lot easier to have desires in our soul after something that's good than actually follow through with going at that thing. I want you to look at verse 9 today. And I want you to look at the, toward the end of verse 9. I just want to read a statement to you right now. The Bible says, And the God of peace will be with you. Now how many of us as Christian people want the God of peace with us? I mean, think of what that would mean in our life. For God Himself to be with us all the time, every moment of the day, with us when we sleep, with us when we wake up, to have His presence with us. All of us want that. But here's what I want to say to us today, Christians. How many of us are striving and desiring to do what the Bible says we have to do to have the God of peace with us? I think many times we're like that little boy. We see Pistol Pete playing and we think, man, I want to be just like that. And when we hear about what we have to do as Christians to be like that, we back off. And today, when we look at a verse like this, all of us want God with us, right? We want the God of peace with us. But what do we have to do to have the God of peace? Let's read verse 8 and 9 together. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. So what the Lord says to us today is if you want the God of peace with you, 
We have to think godly thoughts and do godly things. And we're going to focus more on this first one this morning than the second one. Now you may ask today, you know, why? Why is it that God is so interested in the things that we think about? Why is it that God, the God of all glory, the God who created the world, why is He interested in the thoughts that we have as Christians? And the reason, one of the reasons for that is this. God sees my thoughts just like He sees my actions, right? God is the God of peace, but God is also the God of holiness. And for God to dwell with us, we have to be people who are holy. And what God wants from us is not only to be holy on the outside, but to be holy on the inside, in our thoughts, and in our hearts. This is a huge thing in the Bible. Sometimes we just think about actions, actions. Sometimes preachers and teachers will only speak to our will, what to do. And certainly I must do that. We all must speak to our wills sometime. The biblical method, though, is this. God begins with our mind. The truth comes into our mind, we think about it, we, we dwell on it, we meditate upon the truth of God, and what happens after we think about God's truth is, God's truth goes down into our heart and it starts to affect our emotions and our passions. It starts to move us. And once God's truth has come to our mind and instructed us, and once His truth has then created passion and motivation, if you will, in our heart, then it goes out to our hands. And it affects the things that we actually do. God's way of dealing with us is head, heart, and then hands. You see that in Romans chapter 6, verse 17. And today, what we're looking at really is a battle for our minds. Did you know that we're in a ba battle today for our minds? The world, the flesh, and the devil is after our minds. Because the devil knows if he can control our mind, he has then controlled our heart. And if he controls our heart, he then controls our hands. And the devil's after this right here, up here. It was John Owen, a famous preacher several hundred years ago that talked about, you know, don't, don't talk about, oh, my heart went over there. You know, maybe you're going through life and it just seems like you want to read the Bible, but all of a sudden your heart pulls you over here. He says, don't say your heart pulled you over there. Say, say your mind did. Because your heart can only do what your mind has first put in your heart. And that's what we're looking at today. We want to have God with us. How many of you want God in our church gathering? How many of you want to feel the Spirit of God and have Him leading us and have the presence of God? What does the Bible say? Let the wicked man forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. It all begins in the way that we think. Now, this is not a message today about becoming a Christian. We don't become a Christian by changing the way we think. We become a Christian by coming to God and repenting of our sins, believing on Him in faith alone to save us. But this is a message really about sanctification. That's a big word. How do we become more holy? How do we become more like Christ? And one of the things I want us to see today is this. We have a part to play in our sanctification. We have a part to play today as Christians in becoming more like Jesus Christ. And it's work. And sometimes it's hard work. But it's work that God's Spirit has given us the ability and the desire to pursue and to do. So let's look today, begin in verse 8. Again, verse 8 is the main thing we're going to look at. But if we're going to have the God of peace in our life and in our church... We must think of things that please God. Let's look at it together. Verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is true, what's that speaking about? We are to think and meditate upon truth as opposed to falsehoods. Now, some of you may like to read fictional books. This is not speaking about fictional books. As long as that fictional book communicates truth to you. That's okay. But we as Christian people are to think about true things. Things that are right and true. 
Whatever is honorable, the Bible says. We as Christians today are to think about things that are worthy of respect. We are to think about things that are noble, high thoughts, not the low thoughts of the world. We are to think about the high things of life. The Bible says whatever is just, whatever is right, as opposed to not right or wrong. And also here, we are to think and do what is right. Our thinking is not an end of itself. Our thinking, when we think of things that honor God, it leads to us doing those things that honor God. Whatever is pure, the Bible says. Pure as in holy or clean. Sexually pure, maybe, but it goes far beyond that. Our thoughts, our motives, we are to think of things that are pure as opposed to things that are impure. Whatever is lovely, you may possibly say, pleasing. Things that our thoughts and the way we live may attract other people. We do things that aren't ugly. We do things that will attract because they're lovely things. Whatever is commendable. It's, it's things that are considered good. It's having a good reputation. We don't do things we know that are looked down upon because they're wrong. And then it says, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise. Basically, what this is telling us is, is this. We need, as Christians, to think about everything that's good and right and true, not the things that are bad, and untrue, and false, and impure. This covers everything. So today, as Christians, we ask ourselves, we're hearing from God's Word this morning, we ask ourselves, what does my life look like right now? What does my life look like? What does your life look like? Am I a person that dwells on things that are right and good? When I become upset whether rightly or wrongly, when I become upset at somebody, what goes through my mind? What do I dwell upon? Or do I dwell on the things that are right and true and good? And the Bible says for us to think on these things. You know, it's a humbling thing, isn't it? To know that this morning, God not only has seen our actions of last week and of today, that God has seen every single thought we've thought. That's a humbling thing that should lead us more and more to desire and seek after the things that please God in our thinking, in our minds. Now this is a big, a big thing in the Bible. I want you to listen to several verses this morning that speak about how we are renewed by our thinking. Now that may be a... That may be a, a concept that we don't think about very often. But this is something the Bible speaks about. We as Christian people are changed by what we think about. Listen to Colossians 3.10. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its Creator. The Bible says that we are actually renewed in knowledge after our creator. The things that we learn, the things that we see about God, by those things God changes our hearts, the Scripture says. Psalm 1, verse 2 through 3, But His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on His law He meditates, Day and night. And what happens to a man who loves God's Word and eats God's Word? Eats it like, a, like, a, like food for his soul. It says, He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So if you want to be like an oak of a Christian, the Bible says for us to meditate and think about God's Word. It's by God's truth, God's Word coming within us, coming within our minds. It's God's Word that transforms us. Because it's God's truth that transforms us through His Spirit working in our hearts. Listen to part of Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. It begins with our mind. Now listen, this is not positive thinking. The Bible's not telling us to go out 
think positive thoughts, think everything's going to be okay, and at times just simply lie to ourselves. That's what most people do when they think about positive thoughts. The Bible is telling us to think about things that are right and true, God's Word, God's truth, and to allow that truth to then transform our lives. Like I said last week, we talked about the peace of God. If you weren't here last week, that would be a good message to listen to from Philippians 4 about prayer. But the Bible is not telling us that all, if, if we think good things, everything in our life is going to be corrected and changed. The Bible is not telling us that would be a lie. The Bible is telling us, though, to think the thoughts of God, to think on things that are good, and God will transform our whole being, our heart, our soul, our lives, and when we are transformed, we can even have joy in the midst of our hardships and trials. That's the work of God in our souls. Jesus said in John 17, 17, Sanctify them in, in the truth. Your word is truth. How can we become holy? How can we become set apart? How can we become more like Jesus? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. We hear the word of God. I was, I was, I was telling Brother Covey earlier, yesterday I went to an ordination service in Columbus. A new minister being ordained to the gospel. And I heard a message yesterday out of 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know what? The Word touched me. That's what we want, isn't it? We don't just want knowledge in and of itself. We can all go home and read a book if we want that. But we hear God's Word being preached and taught. We want our hearts to be touched. We want our souls to be changed. We want God's presence to be real and for God to impress His truth upon our minds and affect our hearts and affect our hands. The preacher yesterday was preaching about how Paul charged Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. To think about the holy calling that a minister has and the charge of God upon our lives that He is charging us in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead. To let that truth come to your mind and then to affect your heart. And then to change the way you live. God's Word transforms us. It changes us. It's weighty. It's precious to our souls. 2 Corinthians 3.18 And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed to the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We come before God's Word whether it's God's Word we're reading, whether it's God's Word we're hearing, whether we're in prayer to God, we're with God, the Bible says we're transformed by God. His Spirit working within us changes us. This is one reason it's so important just to preach about who God is. How many of you heard messages just about who God is? Just somebody going through the Bible? The Bible says God is holy, preaching on God's holiness. The Bible says that God is love, preaching on God's love. The Bible says God is faithful, preaching on His faithfulness. It's knowing who God is that comes into our heart and transforms our life. So this is not just some popular, um, easy believing thing that you see on television today. You read these little washy-washy books at the bookstore or whatever. Positive thinking. Declaring positive things about... No, this is reading and hearing God's truth and letting that change our lives. Letting that transform who we are. And this is a big thing in our life. Now, I believe in salvation by faith. And I, I most certainly believe there's truth in that as far as us being sanctified by faith. And yet the Bible makes it very clear if we are going to be changed, we're going to have to work at it. We're going to have to pray. We're going to have to read. We're going to have to, and this is biblical language, we're going to have to put off and put on. That's the way to holiness. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 4, verse 28. He says, let the thief no longer steal. 
but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Paul says if you're a thief this morning, he says it's not enough just to stop stealing. You need to do that. But he says if you're a thief, stop your stealing, but then start working and give to other people. He says, you quit doing the bad thing, but you begin doing the right thing. You may may have a... I don't know what your own struggles are today, but you may struggle with something. The Bible would say, for you just simply to stop that thing is not enough. Yes, you've got to stop that thing. But you have to begin the positive thing. I would ask us today, what are we allowing into our lives? Whether through television, computers, phones, what do we allow ourselves to look at? YouTube, Facebook, etc., etc. What do we allow to come into our lives? Movies? Do we enjoy, as one man talked about, do we enjoy and take pleasure in, as we watch a movie, the things that Jesus Christ died for? Do we take pleasure in watching Somebody in an adulterous relationship knowing that adultery is one thing that Jesus died for? Do we enjoy reading books that has things in it that Jesus died for? What are we allowing into our life? I know I sound like, an, like, a, I know I, I sound like someone's great, 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 great grandfather when I say this, but the music we listen to most certainly affects us. Make no mistake about that, friend. What we listen to, what we allow to come into our lives, affects who we are. There's no doubt about that. It's true. Where do we get our, our, our advice from? Where do we get our, our advice on, on whether it's raising children, the family, church, whatever it is? Do we go to popular shows on television? Do we go to popular radio podcasts? Or do we, first of all, go to the Word of God? Do we go to spiritual leaders who we trust, who live for God? Where do we go to get our way that we live from? Where do we go for that? How do we think about these things? What about the ideas that we have in life? You know, we we may not think that ideas have that much power, but did you know the reason we're in the condition we are right now is because of a false idea that Satan put in the mind of Eve. God had told Eve, you will, if you eat of that true, that tree, you will die. And here comes the serpent, Satan using the serpent. And Satan says to Eve, if you eat of that, you surely will not die. She accepted a false idea that God will not judge. And it's an idea that churches and people all over America have swallowed. God will not judge. I continue doing my sin. I continue doing what I think I know is wrong, but I, but I keep doing it anyway because I enjoy it, and God hasn't punished me yet. But the Bible says there is a day of judgment. What, where's our ideas coming from? What are we allowing to ch- touch and change our thinking and the way that we look at our man-made philosophy? So, for you... Think about this today. Where am I getting my influence from today? Is it wrong to listen necessarily to a secular song? It's not wrong necessarily to do so. All God's truth is God's truth. All truth is God's truth. You may be listening to something. They don't claim to be a Christian, but it just happens they're speaking forth what the Bible says. That may be a rarity, but you can find that. The truth of it is this, though. Many things that we are putting in our souls today, whether, whether they claim to be Christians, whether the people who ingest it claim to be Christians or not, are things that are nothing but poison. Nothing but poison. So what are we allowing into our life? Those are the things we have to put off. But what do we need to bring in? What do we need to put on our lives? Well, you think about it here at Double Branch. And I know we have different schedules. I know, so please, I'm not trying to be legalistic about this. But we have a Sunday night service tonight, right? We have a Wednesday night service. We have Sunday school. 
We're having the home Bible study now. We have fellowships. We have ways that we can fellowship together, hear God's Word, encourage one another, and pray and be transformed by God. We have ways to do that here. There's other ways as well. There's good Christian books. We have the book reading club that we have. There are, in your own life, there's good places to listen to good sermons. If you're interested in some, ask me. I can tell you where to go. I can tell you some resources. I can tell you some books on your own. And I know one of the things that many people are going to say is, but I just don't have time. I just don't have time. And I know not everyone has the same time that everybody else has. So we have to be generous when we look at what other people have to need to do in their life. I understand that. And yet, let me just name one way that you can think about to be able to digest more of God's truth in your soul. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you do a lot of driving? Whether to work and back every day? That is a perfect opportunity, whether through CD, whether through your phone, hooking it up to, the, to your vehicle, to listen to the Bible, to listen to God's truth, to listen to a good godly sermon being preached, to listen to somebody sitting down and they're talking about the things. That is a great opportunity to ingest and to feed and to eat on the things of God more so than maybe we would have otherwise. There are many ways that we can do to bring in God's truth into our mind. And somebody hears this and they say to themselves, well, you know, Brother Clint, that's good. And we know you're a preacher. And we understand that. But we live in the real world. My friends, this world is real. And it's God's. And the biggest thing to do in God's world, the biggest thing to do in the quote-unquote real world is to learn how to live godly in Christ Jesus. That is what we need to do. What are we allowing in to our lives today, beloved. The Bible says this. Think about these things. Think about the good things of life. Think about the holy things of life. It may be, it may be that, that there's a certain activity. Now, I'm thankful I've not, I don't think I've struggled with this, at least not very much recently. But in the past, I've been so consumed with golf because that was my past, I would have to say, you know what, I'm fasting for golf, from golf for a time. Golf is taking my heart, it's taking my soul, I can't allow that to happen, it's a dumb game. I'm not going to do that. I'm fasting from it. And maybe some of you here, you have to say, you know what, I, just, I can't use the thing that I'm watching, thing. it just affects me too much, I'm going to have to just fast and give it up completely. I'm going to give it up. Because I want my thoughts to be pleasing to God. I want God to honor my thoughts. And I want to think about things that God honors so God can change me and make me to the person He wants me to be. Briefly look at verse 9. So first of all, we've got to think about things that please God if we want God to be with us. Secondly, we have to do these things though. Look what it says in verse 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, that's the Apostle Paul speaking. That's what, this is pause there for a moment, that's what each and every one of us should be striving for, to live such a godly life. We can say, look, look at me and live, try. By, I can only do this by God's grace, but look at me and live like me. And God will be with you. Paul says, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. When you read, I'm not going to get into this very much, but when you read Paul's letters, you see some things our culture scoffs at. When you read the letters of Paul that he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you're going to read some things that our church culture scoffs at. But the Bible says we have to make a choice do I want to be looked at as wise in this world or do I want the God of peace with me? Am I willing to be called a fool for Christ Jesus? Am I willing, wrongly, to be called a crazy extremist for Christ just because I try to live biblically? But to have the God of peace with me? 
Or am I going to be like those people in John 12 who believed in Jesus, but they were afraid to confess Him because they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue? And the Bible says they love the praises of men more than the praises of God. So the message today is this. Think thoughts like God wants you to think, and then obey those thoughts and do them. Let me just give you some encouragement here. What would it mean for us today to have the God of peace with us? Now, if you're a Christian, you have God with you. But it's like the illustration I've said before. You can be married, truly, and sitting on the couch with each other. And yet you all know something's between you all. You're married, you're beside each other, but you're not there with each other. Christians can have God with them and yet God not be with them. We want God with us, but we want God really with us, don't we? We want the God of peace to be with us. If we had the God of peace in our life... His peace would be with us in the midst of the difficulties of life. If we had the God of peace with us, His peace would guard our hearts from worry and anxiety and and all the things that trouble our soul. We would still have troubles, but we would be able to bear up under them and have peace in them. doesn't mean our troubles would be gone. doesn't mean our heartache would be gone. But it means God would be with us. His peace would be with us. If we had the God of peace, it means that families could be restored today. Children could love their parents again. You know what? When I was young, I hate to confess this, because I love my dad so much. He's dead now, but I love him so much. But when I was a young teenager, me and my dad at times didn't get along. When I got about 19 or 20, God really came and got a hold of me. You know what happened almost instantly? If not instantly, I love my parents. That's what happens when the Spirit of God comes inside somebody. They're changed. They don't just keep doing the things they've always done. Their relationships are restored. Families can be restored. Parents to their children. Children to their parents. Husband to wife. Wife to husband. Relatives, etc. We can have restoration when the God of peace has come into our hearts. And then if we had the God of peace with us today, you know what we could have? We could have more of God. And my friends, that should be the only thing we need to hear to motivate us. There's never been a man on his deathbed say, I wish I didn't have so much of the Bible in my life. There's never been a man on his deathbed who said, I wish I didn't pray so much in my life. I wish I did something else. There's never been a man or a woman on their deathbed who said, you know what, I just spent too much time thinking about the things of God. Just the opposite is true, isn't it? How many of you have had a close experience with death, maybe? And you think to yourself, oh, I need to do things different. Or maybe you say, oh, I wish I would have done this. I Let me tell you something. This book, our church gatherings, Prayer, witnessing, serving God, we'll never regret doing these things. And if we do these things, we'll have all of eternity to praise God that He gave us the grace to do these things. My friends, we are in a battle. We are in a battle for our minds, for our hearts, for our hands, what we do. It's a battle worth fighting, though, isn't it? It's a battle worth fighting. I've got good news. It's a battle through the Spirit of God and the Word of God and the church of God that God will give us the victory in. Praise God for that. Amen.